All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce our guest today, Carol Britton Chambers and Tyler R. Carey, um, authors of the new uh, warm-up book, The Complete Warm-Ups for Band. And I'm really excited. I'm Andre Wilkins, uh, band director at Salida High School in Salida, Colorado. Um, Carol, Tyler, welcome. Great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. And as we mentioned just before we got started, uh, the goal of today's episode uh, is going to be cleaning up uh, some vertical alignment between middle school band and high school band and make sure that we can come out of some of the COVID restrictions that we had over the past few years and make sure we're doing what's best for students in our band programs. Um, so to get started, um, Carol, why don't you start us off and give us a little bit of your background and what you do and anything you want to brag about? Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I'm currently a composer and an arranger. I live in San Antonio, Texas, um, but I'm a huge fan of the mountains. We have a place in northern New Mexico, so not quite up as far north as you, but close. That's my love. But uh, anyway, I'm also on the faculty of Texas Lutheran University, where I serve as the composer in residence and teach composition and some things like that. Um, and then I'm the owner of Aspenwood Music. Um, and before all that, I was a band director. I taught middle school and high school band mostly. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in music education from Texas Tech University and my master's in trumpet performance from Northwestern University. Right on. Tyler? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler R. Carey. I was a band director in Alabama for a few years, um, but I also uh, had this uh, great love of writing music, and I got lucky and published through Carl Fisher, which just so happens is how I met Carol. She just doesn't remember it. I uh, I played one of her pieces with my group, Cedar Canyon Sketches, and uh, I sent her a recording, which always is horrible to do as a director. And she was very kind. Uh, they were very young and they did a great job, but um, that's how I met Carol. And then just so happened that when uh, I got the job here at Excelsior Music Publishing to be the uh, editor and the production manager, um, that Carol also came along and started sending us music and we formed a fantastic working and personal relationship and and we had a blast writing this book so that's kind of a little bit about me that's a great transition for our first question why did you write the complete warm-up for band okay yeah so so tyler and i really wanted uh, to create um what we would consider a, a current um valuable resource for band directors um that would prepare their ensembles for rehearsal and for performance and it would focus on est establishing ensemble fundamentals, as well as providing numerous exercises, you know, that keep improving individual technique and skill also. That's part of it, of course. Um, but we wanted to, the book to be very complete, um, so have a lot of exercises, but also very versatile. So meaning it can be used if you have a lot of time for a more lengthy warm up, or it can be beneficial if, you know, those days when you need or want to do more of a shorter warm up. So, yeah, Tyler, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think uh, Carol and I both get out in the classrooms a lot and um, we get to work with groups. And the first thing that a group will do when you're there is they'll say, we're going to do our warm up. And you're always like, great, awesome. And you're sitting there. And sometimes I feel um, like you're getting this like a uh, fishbowl look into a a classroom, right? Because when they turn around and do their warm up, they're a little exposed. And one of the things that I found is that uh, we we see a very similar abridged warm up from lots and lots of groups, and uh, it's not usually very intentful. So we're not, um, you know, if they're playing a piece in E flat, usually the B flat scale is the biggest go to, right? B flat or F, um, which is fine. We all did that. I did that, you know. And uh, I am I am one hundred percent guilty of always playing the same Claude T. Smith chorale, no matter what I was doing. And while that's great. Um, I started to realize that we would do this warm up and I'd see this warm up and then we would move right into the music and we'd spend about the first 10 minutes of the music fixing all the things we could have done in the warm up because we were trying to warm up the group without tying it to the music. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to do this book was I wanted to start forming relationships between the warm up and what we're about to play, but also relationships between the fundamentals we're learning and the repertoire that we're going to do from middle school all the way up into, as Carol likes to say, beyond. So, 
Yeah. And, and also just with, through this, you know, you, you can really establish, start to establish and form a vocabulary with your students. You know, you're working on certain articulations and how, how do we describe that? And what do we do? And, and again, like he just said, like Tyler just said, you know, making all these fundamentals should transfer to music. That's the end goal is that we get to perform and play great music. And so, you know, so how can you make your time as efficient and meaningful as possible? And a lot of warm-ups out there are older, so we thought, hey, a nice new cover would really spruce things up out in the world, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that was that was part of my reasoning for going down this uh, path of finding some new warm-ups. Not that the ones I've been using haven't worked, but looking for something new and something to collaborate with my colleagues on. Um, Carol, you mentioned that um, the warm-up could be as short as you want or as long as you want. And one of our first questions is walking through a lesson. Um, how do you prioritize when you have to, you know, shorten your warmups? How do you prioritize what's needed to be covered? Well, yeah. So all the time I was teaching and then the group of other directors that I taught with, I was, I felt very lucky. Uh, a big portion of the time I was teaching, I was with what I would call a team and we mm -hmm. were very much aligned sixth grade through 12th grade. So that was my one of my favorite points or times and when I was teaching because we were all on the same page and we would get together and talk about okay where do we want our beginners to be around Christmas time and at the end of the year and then what about mm -hmm. when they leave middle school and what do we want them to know when they leave our entire program when they graduate and what kind of music do we want to be able to play what sort of goals do we have do we want to maybe apply if to you know to maybe get to go to Midwest or things like that you know we just mm -hmm. we talked through everything and so we would have um many you know sort of um you know times throughout the year where we wanted certain goals to try to be met so we had some vision and so it, it didn't matter if we were working with our seventh grade because i like to refer to seventh uh, here it's about seventh grade when they mm -hmm. they're beginning it's more like in sixth grade i know some people that's more like fifth or sometimes even fourth yeah um, yeah here we're more uh, we're at what i'm used to is more sixth grade beginners so seventh grade is sort of when you're in a full ensemble setting for sure um, and then beyond, you know, and so <clears throat> it didn't matter which age group we were working with, but we always thought it was important to, of course, always have every day reminders of posture, doing reinforcement of good breathing habits, because just because you tell them, as we all know, just because you tell them one time doesn't mean that's good. It's not, you got to remind them every day. So doing a little bit of that um, and then focusing on things like steady air tone, starting, stopping notes together, then you start adding your fingers. Then you start doing more technique, um, scale patterns. So anyway, um, so Tyler and I kind of set this up in what we call modules. And modules mm -hmm. is a, a fancy word for just an area. And so breathing, you know, in your body posture and all that, good tone, um, scales, which doesn't just mean scales, but, you know, and Tyler can elaborate on this too, but just the, the relationships of keys. So that's all kinds of patterns, mm -hmm. like a thirds and so on. Um, and then, of course, tech, technique, where in our module, our technical module, that's where we start um, providing exercises where you can work on different articulations, especially. Um, and then rhythmic module. So definitely just we have pages of rhythm patterns um, going into all kinds of um, meters and so on, and even getting into triplets, compound meter and so on. And then ensemble our Finally, our ensemble module has mostly to do with corrals. So that's sort of putting all of this together. Yeah. And, if, and it's in all, we have all 12 major keys covered and most of the minor keys. So um, I guess the short answer, I mean, I have a long answer too, but the short answer is you could pick just one or two exercises from each module or from each area and get a very complete warm up. But then on certain days, or maybe more towards the beginning of the year, um, you could, maybe you want to devote most of your, uh, rehearsal time um, to these kinds of fundamentals and stuff so you can do more and then of course as they get older and progress we've got plenty of exercises here yeah I don't think you'll ever outgrow it um, because there are ones that are more demanding than others so uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this uh, uh, on me inferring this but what I'm hearing is shortening the warm-up isn't choosing which modules to leave out. You still hit all the modules. You just do the shortened version within each module. Yeah, it's like a it's like a balanced breakfast, right? You know, all those <laughs> modules, all those modules are what we're saying, and what I think that we all, everyone in the band world, might agree is that those are all the makings of, uh, you know, fundamental development. 
So you really shouldn't leave any of them out. Um, so the idea is that you should be able to hit at least one from each of those modules with as little time as five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and that would still be a more balanced, complete warm up than just running through a corral. And, you know, the, it will be effective to what you're doing in the music, especially if you can at least map out, you know, whatever key you're starting with, just as something simple like that. If the first piece is going to be in the if F major, then we can just quickly go through and select one from each module in F major, and you should have a pretty balanced warm up. Right on. Um, so when I'm talking about, uh, I'm going through my questions over here and making sure that I'm trying to stay on subject with what we're talking about um when you carol you brought up seventh grade is your second year uh i mean there's a ton of beginning band method books out there and they all do a good job what is your expectation for a second year student coming in to be able to use this method book appropriately and tyler you could jump in on that answer too carol just brought that up yeah um well okay so yeah, because I, I wouldn't necessarily consider this a beginning book because it it just goes into so many more exercises that I don't that beginners probably aren't going to be doing. But um, for for me, the you know non negotiable is characteristic sounds and resonant sound. Oh, wow! And so to, to me, whatever, yeah, you might not be um, in this. So when they get to seventh grade, they may not be able to do exercise blah 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 yet. But whatever exercises they can do, we're still not compromising their sound. So, you know, at the end of the beginner, beginning year, and, and the reason I'm referencing seventh grade here is because um, a, a lot of schools around here also, not, not everywhere, but um, sometimes it's common for beginning classes to be just with their own instrument here. Yep. Um, and so the first time they come together as an ensemble, like a complete ensemble here is like more like second year players. Right. Um, so this, I don't think, I mean, you can, I've had people already writing me, hey, we are using this with our beginners. Of course, they're just doing the easier exercises. So you right. can do that. You can do that if you want. Um, but this is more about ensemble setting. And so you're working on, you're still always working on individ, your individual skill of, am I producing the right kind of sound with, the, with a beautiful start to the note and a beautiful end to the note? But now you get in with an ensemble, it's now can you start doing this? And maybe it's the simplest exercise in here. But are you able to now listen to the person on either side of you and match what they do? And, you know, that's how we get rid of all that extra noise and clutter. Yeah. Ensemble sound is the more people can match vowel sounds and these other things. And so then you get into articulation. So whatever um, exercises they are at the level where they can, they can handle, that's what you do as long as they're still getting a good sound. And then you just keep progressing and giving them, you know, again, developing their, their skills um, and starting to give them harder things. Awesome. Like I, to, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was just, thank you for that answer. That cleared up a lot of what I was asking. Tyler, you're up. I was just going to say, I like to think about um, exactly what Carol was saying about this idea that, you know, the, the focus of the program should be the sound. I mean, without that, you don't have much. And so I kind of like relate it back to when we're all learning in school about uh, the band program and how to create a healthy band program, you know, our concept of sound, our our good tone production is in the center. And then we have, you know, the jazz band over here and marching band over here and all of the other extracurriculars that add in to creating that. And uh, if you look at how the book's laid out, that's kind of how we do it. We end up at the ensemble sound, right? And so everything that we're doing is building towards good tone production, good technique, good precision, good flexibility and all that stuff to get us to the end goal, which is the corrals, which of course should lead us directly into the music. And again, we're just trying to create this relationship from breathing at the beginning and getting your body ready to play to actually performing music, which I do think is a little bit different than a beginning method, right? A beginning method, we're trying mm -hmm. to teach them how to produce, how to uh, just play certain notes and how to learn these smaller intricacies. And then after you get past that beginning year and you start getting into second year, we start getting into what I consider to be more resource methods, which is how do we then take what we learned in the beginning method book and then translate it. And so that's kind of what this is, while also trying to be an easy resource for directors to be able to warm up their group without having to put too much effort into planning. So. Well, thanks for making it easier on us for our planning time. You know, we don't get as much as we used to anymore. <laughs> 
Um, that was actually one of the things that I noticed as soon as I got the book in the mail, which thank you so much for sending me a copy, was the body module. Um, I'm not quite 100 percent sure how to ask this question, so I'll do my best. But what was your research isn't the word, but these seem like all this seems like almost like a yoga class before band. Um, so I'm wondering, um, part of it was just Carol wanted to make me have to do all these exercises to try them out. So that was, that was, you know, that was part of it. I wanted to see his drawings. His, nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, um, it, Carol and I talked a lot about this book and cause one of the biggest things as just a composer in general, but as, as an educator that's writing resources is, is uh it's almost um the imposter syndrome right it's real it's mm -hmm. it we start asking questions it's the same thing like doing a clinic you go gosh you know there's there's midwest level caliber directors in front of me at this clinic and then you know, i'm not a midwest level caliber conductor and um and then you start asking well geez maybe the stuff we're putting in this book is just you know not needed or it's just like duh for everybody else and then we started to have conversations like well i didn't know all of this stuff when i started and so mm -hmm. there's going to be people out there that haven't figured this out yet. And the people that have figured this out, they don't need it. You know what I mean? So um, one of the reasons why we put that in there is because we really can't call it complete if we don't. And so we needed to make sure that we were being honest with the fact that a good warm up from start to finish, although I hated breathing exercises with my big breathing bag, my teacher had my spirometer and all that stuff, they were important and they helped me become a better musician. And so that's kind of our reasoning, even though there's probably, and of course, I, you know, there's the breathing gym out there and it's hard to compete with that, but we wanted something abridged if you don't use that, just so you have it here. So that's my <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think it's just more than anything a reminder, and then it does gives you some structure. It's like, okay, okay, you know, I I don't know what to do. All right, I'll do this. We can breathe in for two, out for four. Um, you know, lots of ensembles have the way they like to do it. For me, I think having some visual with your hand, having the students do it with your hand, is nice. And what is important about that to me is, hey, you're not stopping your air and then letting your body get all tight. It's more one continuous motion. So again, it's. You know, the teacher needs to know why am I giving this exercise right now and what do I want my students to get out of it and how do I expect them to do it correctly. And so, you know, everybody's going to have their own um, judgment and opinions about that. But it's just some things here you can do. And, you know, maybe you had never done the one where you can do some stretching. And But, but you know, I, I think all wind players especially would agree that that something of this in this area is important every day with your ensemble. Um, the bell just went off, so that's we're going to have that song in the background of this episode. Um, okay, public school teaching. Um, okay. No, what I, what I love about it, and I'm like, I want to hold this up as I look through it, and I really like that you're giving really clear uh, direction for how students should be moving their body and how the airflow works. And this, I'll try and show this up. This airflow model, this I've tried to do this in my warm ups already without having all the resources of just using my conducting gestures to help indicate how the students should breathe. And that, I mean, with percussionists, too, I mean, it's nice to have everybody on the same page with the same breath. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. I, I, I found it very helpful. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things that I really. Uh, liked about the book as I went through is that you are using the term module. When I talk to my principal and we're going through at the end of the year, my review, and you know, it's, it's not easy to talk music teacher to non music teacher admin. And so uh, the vocab words that you use in here, I, I really what I, what I'm interested in is how to pre and post test using this method book so I could convince my admin that this is a worthy resource to use and it's they need their their buzzwords to make it uh, more appealing, I guess would be the word. But is there anything you could speak to um, as far as how you would use this as a uh, assessment um, that I could then turn in to show that I'm being an effective teacher? Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll take the first crack at this one. Um, you know, I explained 
I, everything everything Tyler says is a metaphor or or something like that. Sorry, um, but well, <laughs> that's okay. That, explain <laughs> assessing students like or or fundamentals, for instance, with band like budgeting a band program, right? And every every administrator knows about the word budgeting and trying to figure out where money goes, right? Uh, but also, um, I think about it like uh, exercises too, right? Like physical exercises. So like the way that we're assessing students in music is we're setting goals, right? So if you can create goals based off of, and I think this will tie into another question later, probably if you can create goals based off the literature that you would like to perform. I mean, our literature is our textbook. It's the most important thing a director does every year is sit down and hopefully painstakingly figure out what pieces to play. Um, and so that's our goal. That's where we are ending up. And so if you can tie in exercises and fundamental development from this book and show how it progresses into the repertoire that you are picking and then have a successful performance of that repertoire. Or if you want to get even more uh, in the weeds, uh, successful pass-offs with that repertoire or whatever. But if you can directly tie that to the method that you're using, I think that will create a line that an illustrator is going to very easily follow, especially in, in our book, we we made uh, we took care to add words that are meaningful to admin, like the word rigor and adding rigor. Mm -hmm. And so like we can show that progressively from start to finish these exercises in the keys that translate the rhythms that translate directly into the music that we've programmed. We have our spring concert. Voila, we now have assessment that shows that we have been on track to reach this goal from the beginning and here's the proof and it's all in the book you know and i think that's kind of what i would do as far as uh, and that's honestly everything i've ever found that admin really want is they want to see that you have a, a, a kind of goal post and then a plan to get there that mm -hmm. is educationally meaningful so yeah Thank you. sorry if i you know if i can just add no, absolutely so, yeah i mean so same thing i just think it's easy to um write down or whatever long-term goals short-term objectives so whatever short term means does that mean every grading period we want to you mm -hmm. know assess that our kids are being able to do this does it mean every week i mean we had weekly little objectives that our kiddos would do um but all those are with the long-term goals in mind you know um but you know and just to be even more specific especially some of these like articulation technical etudes that we have in here or rhythmic technical etudes we have a lot mm -hmm. of those um, those would be perfect for just little, <clears throat> if you want to assign like a little playing test or whatever you call it, or chair test, little assessments. Um, most of these are about two lines long. You could just do one line of it if you want it to even be that short. But again, just little nuggets that you can be, hey, this, you guys, this is going to be your pass off or your chair test or, you know, for next week. And so it's always giving them little things to play. But again, the teacher has to know why am I assigning this particular one? You have to lead your students in the building blocks, you know, the blocks that keep building on what was there before. Um, and so you have to have, you know, you have to know the why and mm. the reason. The students don't really know, but you are leading them to these long-term goals, so. Cool. No, those are great. Uh, and I, I will definitely be implementing it that way. That, that, that's really good <laughs> advice, thank you. Um, the next question I have is using this book to choose literature. Uh, this is a question that came from our middle school director, Katie Oglesby. I told her I'd give her a shout out. Um, and the question was, how do I know when my students are ready to go from grade one and a half to grade two, grade two to grade three? What is, and in, as a 14 year teacher, I was just like, I don't know. You kind of just do a couple Frank Erickson pieces and you see which one they could do well. <laughs> um, Me, I, you know, I thought a lot about this question in particular, believe it or not. Um, and I think I think it's probably better to flip that and say, you know, how do we use this book to get to the literature that we want to program, you know, as opposed to how do I how do I select literature based off of what's in the book? There's, it's sort of like the 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 cart before the horse a mm -hmm. little bit um, because I think one of the things that Carol and I were trying to be very careful about with this is that we don't ever want this book to feel like we are telling directors how they should do things and more of we are trying to give easily accessible um, pathways to success that you know we're not we're not guiding as much as we are providing the opportunities for growth um, and it's easy to get to 
And I think you can kind of relate that back to that question. Um, I don't have a good answer for that either on where, on, on when a, uh, you know, I can tell you from a publishing standpoint where I know the grade level guidelines are and where I know ranges are for what we've learned in the method book versus what we've learned in the previous grade level of music. So where we should be able to go, you know, now we've gone from a C to a D in the trumpets written. And, you know, I, I can mm -hmm. tell you that, but um, one of the things I think is I'm going to, I'm going to steal Carol's thunder for a second and say, I think if you can get them to play a similar grade level in this book and have it with a good resonant sound and characteristic tone and good ensemble blend, then you as the expert in the room are going to be able to make a very informed decision as to whether or not you move to the next grade level. And um, while we are excited to have put together the book, you're the expert in the room and you're going to know your students the best. And so my thing is use the book to help you get to whatever grade level you want to get to. Yeah. And, and just to, to kind of add on, yeah, right on Tyler. Um, just to add on a little, uh, certainly I think you can plan a little bit ahead. Like if there is a piece, a lot of times um, grade level and whether or not your band can do that, sometimes that really does depend on the range. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think publishers have gotten a lot better about standardizing that and, and everything so that you can kind of know what to expect. Hey, if I pick a grade three, my first trumpet's probably only going to go up around here, something like that. So range is sometimes what you have to look at. And it just depends on what skills your, your students do have at the moment. But I think you can, like, let's say you have this piece and you're like, okay, I think we can do everything. We haven't encountered this rhythm yet, though. Dotted 8 16th, for example, or some, some little bit of syncopation or something like that. So you could then, of course, find some exercises in this book to reinforce that. Hey, I want to get my students ready for this piece that I want to pass out. And we're at the point now we can start to introduce this kind of rhythm, these patterns. <laughs> da, da, da. So we're going to use these pages in the book, reinforce that. And then again, it will transfer to the music. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what I wrote this question weird and I don't want to ask it that way based on our conversation so far, when you have an eighth grader that finishes up and is going to high school band, like in our situation, we only have one concert band at the high school. We don't have a tiered concert band, symphonic wind ensemble. Um, what would be, outside our characteristic tone. And I'm really happy that you've made the foundation for that, Carol. Um, it's good to be reminded of that. What's something you think a middle schooler needs to come out of middle school knowing for high school that we could say, this is, if you could do this high school band is for you. And I don't necessarily mean to pigeonhole a student that isn't at that level because some people start in eighth grade and they're just at a second, their second years in ninth grade. That's a hard question, right, Carol? Because like you think about all the different times in, in the eons of band when certain things are expected, it's kind of hard to put a a, uh, a, a to it. However, um, I think I was if and I know you said except for this, but that I mean, that was kind of, you know, uh, if my students showed up for middle school and they had a good sound and they kind of had an idea about fundamentals. Um, and they had some scale work under their belt. I felt confident if if that development was there that I could take it where I needed it to go. And of course, I don't think the I don't think the mantra of less is more applies here. I think as much as middle school feeders and I absolutely adored my middle school feeders. I mean, they're the only reason you get to exist as a high school uh, ensemble because without them, you you start from scratch. Absolutely. So, um, my my thing was support them as much as possible and get out there. And if you have expectations and they are willing to work with those expectations, you need to get out there and help them do it. You can't just say this is what needs to happen by the time you get to high school and expect your feeders to just have to do it. That's not their job. Their job is to keep kids in band and have engaged and fun and learn music there. But if you have expectations, that's great. But you need to go out there and do some legwork too. So um I, uh, yeah, that's a hard question to answer because every program is different. So, mm -hmm. like I said, my biggest thing, kind of like with Carol, was if they sounded good, I wanted them to have a good tone. I wanted, I mean, that fundamental development of, of producing sound is really important. And then, you know, I could take it from there. Yeah. And I think, honestly, just at the um, middle school level, if you, 
if you just start that when they're beginners, the, this, the whole sort of like, this is what it's going to be to be in Ben and you get them used to, we're going to have these little tests, but you make it just really fun mm -hmm. and you celebrate every time they reach. So we can talk more about that because we're going to talk about engaging middle students. Are we still going to talk about that? Oh yeah, that's right. That's okay. where I was going I'll, next. I'll talk about that more <laughs> now. But just, but, but generally, um, right from the get go, if they know, if they're under, if, if they kind of get, oh, this is what it is. I am expected to practice, but you set it up in a real positive mm -hmm. way. And that just, that is going to, um, you know, just propel them through the different stages. They'll, they'll be ready. And if they have a love for it and, you know, they got to have, they got to like it too. So that's, what's going to make them want to join up for the high school band. But just, just again, trying to get those skills. Um, so yeah, it's the sound, but of course their technical proficiency, their flexibility, their range, just that those keep growing each year, you know. And just letting them know there's a place for you in the high school band. It doesn't matter. You, you, don't, Absolutely. Have to be, you don't have to be first chair. Yeah. Yeah. This question came to me uh, from a parent at our, uh, you know, high school welcome new ninth grade night where parents said my kid didn't make the middle school honor band, but they still want to be in band in high school. Should we encourage them to do that? And it was absolutely. But that was I, I didn't really have the vocabulary. You, you made it very clear just now about wanting to be in band, that would have been, I would rather had that answer for that parent <laughs> uh, right. at the time. And so that leads us to our next question. How do you, how do you get, how do you get middle schoolers engaged to become, you know, the band nerds that go on the high school? This one's mm. easy. See, this yeah. one's not a hard question. That's it. That's <laughs> I'm trying to differentiate here. <laughs> uh, I'll start mine short. So I'll start. Cause I know Carol's itching to get to this one. Um, <laughs> I have never met a successful director at any level that was not engaged, passionate, and excited about what they're doing. And kids, they will 1000% eat off of that. If you show up to work and you are excited about learning the A flat note on your horn in the method book, they will be excited. I mean, it's a, it's sort of a show. You have to be passionate about and if you if you aren't passionate about learning a flat today that's okay um as long as they think you are um and so if you're excited about the music they're playing if you i mean one of the things that shocked some some people in my community when i took over our band program is the kids went from wanting to play marching band all the time to playing lyrical pieces because i am just i am a sucker for lyrical pieces mm -hmm. and i just i just beat them over the head with the fact that we're making real music. This is exciting. Don't you feel that? Do you feel this? Do you get goosebumps? And I'd show them, I, oh, look, I got goosebumps. You know, <laughs> And I got them into it because I wanted to be able to take it past just playing the notes and rhythms excitedly. And I wanted to play, make some, I wanted to say something. And, um, and then they got excited because I was excited and I could put anything in front of them, except for this one time I put a really, really slow Bach thing um, in front of them. It was like 40 beats per minute. They just weren't ready yet. I wasn't mm -hmm. either, so uh, we, we can that real quick. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, if you're excited and you're gung-ho, and I mean, they they will be too. Yeah. I don't, FYI, I don't really want to conduct at 40 beats per minute either. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to subdivide that. <laughs> my, poor, my poor clarinet, my poor clarinet just stared at me, just like, yeah. I hate you. It's like I'm sorry. It's, it's sight reading. It's good for you. It's like broccoli. Let's go, you know? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're into your diet, your healthy diet stuff today, Tyler. That's awesome. <laughs> I have always uh, liked broccoli, even since I was a child. I do, I do too. I got to admit. Um, okay, what I was going to say, it's just funny because just the other day, um, I saw this quote, so I'm going to throw her name out there, but Paula Kreider, she was doing a clinic somewhere. I don't know if you guys saw it, but, you know, of course, long time renowned music educator. Um, and she was doing some presentation, but anyway. Uh, her quote was, fun is the joy of high achievement. So fun is the joy of high achievement. And I'm so going to tell her, I'm going to use that because that is totally when, again, when I was teaching with this team of directors and stuff, that is what we really tried to do. It's like the, the stuff we're learning in band is going to be fun. We're not going to do all this extra silly stuff. No, no, no. We're Every day we have a plan. We're going to come in and you're going to get better. Um, but, you know, students want that. They want to be successful. They want to sound good. They, yeah. don't, they don't want to sound bad. They don't want to mess up on the shirt. They want to sound good. <clears throat> they want to play cool, fun music. So, of course, again, that's our job to get them set there with a great on shirt from the beginning and, and all that. But, but again, so that's where that whole, we would set up little mini objectives and stuff. Um, and 
little ones that could always be met pretty much 99% of the time, um, as long as we're giving the right kind of instruction. And so some of these would be daily things like tomorrow when you come in, I'm going to check for this or that or weekly, you know, um, and then we would make the hugest deal when when they reached it. And, um, you know, it might be uh, so it's a lot of constant positive reinforcement of things. But again, they don't they don't know anything when they come in. They don't know what band is. It's just whatever you train them. Right. Right. From the start. Um, but sometimes it'd be over a tiny thing like, OK, remember, I said we're having a pencil check today. This is more like with beginners, probably. But, mm -hmm. you know, pencil check. And well, Kelly has four pencils on the stand right there. So everybody get Kelly hand, or Kelly mm -hmm. gets to be first chair, whatever. It doesn't even always have to do with playing. Um, I can remember one time I was teaching a, this again was probably beginners, but I was doing brass and then in the other room, my uh, coworker, he was working with woodwinds and I could just, we were just, we were nerdy about this, but he would just run and he said, Hey, my clarinets just learned such and such a scale, two octaves or so on. You guys come here, come here. We'd all get up out of our chair, you know, and I'll go in there and, and they would do it. So we would do these little performances for each other, make a big, huge deal or someone, you know, my flute just did the three octaves you know, just things and it would just, their faces would light up. So it's again, setting up little goals for them, little mini objectives and ensuring that they reach them most of the time. And um, they just get so, so excited about that. So it's kind of, and then, you know, once then that's all, they know that's what band is. And then they come together in full band. Um, and there's not a lot of silly, you know, this goes for uh, behavioral things as well, but it's like, you sort of just send this message right away. I learned this from one of my mentors we're going to have so much fun in here, but it's all going to have to do with playing. Um, and by the way, I'm in charge of the fun. You know, I'm the director, mm -hmm. but we will have so much fun um, just celebrating each time you get better and better. So I think that's, yeah, how you just really get middle school, school, well, all, all, all of them fired up. Man, that sounds, that sounds like it worked out a whole lot better than all of us getting up to just go laugh at the drummers. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a joke. that's a joke everyone yep. I know. Yes. we know but um, cha. um <laughs> uh so this um on our conversation so far this is this is not a question i gave you beforehand so i apologize and if you don't feel like you want to Surprise. answer it or you're not yep it's it, it's okay if you don't feel uh the need to answer it but I've been dealing with, I've had a lot of, not just students that want to be teachers, but also a lot of mentees over the past few weeks that are getting ready either to plan for next year. They're teachers that are in their first three years and they went through the same struggles. We all went through our first three years. So I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts on how you would explain this method book and how to use it, which I think you've already given a lot of great information in this, but for that first year teacher, second year teacher, that is like, I don't know, I played first chair and I don't, I've never dealt with somebody that was happy being third chair. Um, and so, yeah, just curious on how you would explain this to a beginning band director, not teaching beginning band, but a new band director on how to use this, why to use this and Yes, that's how I'm going to well, ask that question. <laughs> well, first, I think it's important to say to all new directors out there, hang on, that first year is going to be whatever it's going to be, all right? Just, and it's, and, it's, and it's all normal and nothing's weird and we've all had the same thoughts. So first off and foremost, I think uh, just hang in there. You're going to be perfectly fine. Um, and, you know, you're not going to do as much damage because for, for me, that was me. I was, I remember I'm going to ruin these sixth graders. Like I'm just, <laughs> they're gone. It's like, I just, I remember thinking the, the next year, looking at the seventh graders, I'm so sorry. We're going to try and make it up. I really, you know, so first is just, everything's going to be fine. Um, and then the second thing, and this is the biggest thing, and hopefully you've heard this in college. This is the biggest thing that makes the most difference in any kind of teaching is consistency. Whatever you do, apply it every day it's like and and carol's gonna make fun of me because i'm gonna make it's like it's like losing weight it's like uh, <laughs> you know it, it, the, you might not think progress is happening but when you look back on it in a couple months progress was happening every day uh, yeah. even if it doesn't feel like it and so if you're if you're trying to get them to sing you got to sing every day if you're trying to get them to sound good you got to work on tone and and intonation and producing a good characteristic sound every day and um, that's a good lesson for band directors everywhere, because even even professionals work long tones. Mm -hmm. so. Well, 
Yeah, again, I think my, uh, well, one thing, I'm piggyback on what he said, you know, things are going to be okay. And, but also, um, first thing I would say is just, uh, learn from others and don't be afraid to get a mentor and don't be afraid to ask because we pretty much learned everything, honestly, that we know from someone else, you know, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's already people out there that have figured things out. So just go watch others, invite them in and be willing to be humbled, you know, mm -hmm. like, okay, come on and, then, and be willing to accept, Hey, this is what I'm noticing, you know, not your kids never stopped talking. So guess what? They never, ever heard anything that you had to say. So you didn't really, they didn't really learn much today. You know, if you're willing to hear things like that, it's like, oh, how can I fix it? You know, that kind of thing. So if you're willing to uh, just get honest feedback, then put certain strategies in, in place, um, but not tons of strategies all at once. Just like with this book, just pick a couple of exercises to start with, you know, out of each module or something. And again, to me, it's really important. Why at that moment are you going to have them do this exercise in the first place? And maybe it's just, I just want y'all to get your best sound. Okay. Never mind. We're not starting together, stopping together. Okay. <laughs> we won't do that today, but we got to get our best sound. And so let's start by singing and do a vowel sound, you know, so just something not, you can't throw everything at once for them to think about because it's too much and you shouldn't teach that way either. So if you just, if you go in and I'm going to do one thing out of each module, let's say if we're talking about this book, why am I giving it? What do I expect to hear when they play this right now? If you don't hear it, what did you not hear that was right? What feedback can you give to make it better? Hey guys, let's all just breathe together and start our note together. Okay, try that. Let's all, you know, so it's just, again, I'm not trying to just take on everything at once. I think if that makes any sense. Makes a ton of sense. Yeah. That's a, it's good things for me to be reminded of too. Uh, yeah. That that's not just for the beginning band director. That's, yeah. that's for all of us. You know, how many times do we have we gotten on the podium and then suddenly you're sort of like overwhelmed, like, OK, wait, <laughs> you know, and then at some point we realize maybe it's around our third year of teaching. It's like, wow, if I just let's just work on the opening 20 measures on this piece mm -hmm. today and let's slow the sucker down. And, you know, you, at some point you start to sort of realize I'm just throwing too much at them right now. Let's little chunks, maybe one concept. Guys, we're going to do it again. I just want you to focus on this one concept right now. You and know? sometimes it doesn't get better. Yeah. yeah, be the next day. Or, and or it, uh, yes, sorry, Tyler. I was just gonna say, mine used to always scare me the day or two before the concert, almost like clockwork. The mm -hmm. day or two before the concert, mm -hmm. you'd walk in and mm -hmm. it'd be like, we don't remember anything. And uh, it took me a while to get to the point where I went, I understand what this is. You know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. you, you little cherubs, just do whatever you want today, and then we'll pick up tomorrow, and it'll be great. You know, so yeah, cool. And if, yeah, and again, if you um. Yeah, like they might not have it. They might not get it all the way today. And so definitely yeah. don't no don't go on tomorrow to something else. We need to get that, you know? We need to get this steady note or whatever it is that that's mm -hmm. the foundation. We shouldn't be going on and then doing all this hard stuff. We're not ready. We need so you got to be you have to be willing to be tedious and you can teach them to be tedious too. But again, in a fun way. You celebrate, you know, little successes. So Right on. Um, we're hitting our last few minute mark from the time we agreed upon. So I'm going to close out, obviously, first by saying thank you. But also, I have some fun questions that you could take as long or as little as you'd like. Um, and I'll just give you um, the three, and you could answer them all at once. Uh, what is your favorite piece to teach? What was your favorite teaching moment and favorite moment as a music student? Um, cool. I'll run, I'll run that one first. Uh, before I do, I want to, I want to, I'm going to circle back to one thing. Cause I thought it oh. was, it's an interesting, we do, we do, uh, at the company, we record about 80 or so concert band pieces a year when we sit a, we sit a band on stage. Um, and then they just, they play tunes and we record them and that's our demo groups for the stuff and everybody can listen to them, listen to any Carol's music or mine. And you'll, you'll hear that group. Um, and I think it's, it's important to remind students that are learning how to play that professionals also have uh the same fundamental needs um i remember we were playing i'm going to pick on carol we we're playing one of her pieces uh with the group and they sit on this big unison unison uh g i think it is and it's this big unison g with a bunch of the low reeds and low winds and they just were not in tune and so we had to stop a professional group and say hey yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you know, let's do that again. You need to listen to it. So, I mean, it happens all the way up. And I think that's important to tie it into the book is that fundamentals happen from start to finish. Um, so uh, to pivot back to your question, my favorite piece to teach was always The Hounds of Spring by Alfred Reed. Um, and I know that's a little lofty uh, of a piece to teach, but for some, I don't get to conduct that kind of uh, challenging music too often. Uh, and so it's got so much fun stuff in it and so many, um, so many characteristic moving lines it's a joy to put together and it's and it's as as dr Kreider would say uh the end goal is going to bring you as much as the end goal is going to bring you all the joy you need to do the work for that piece um so that's my favorite piece to teach especially it's just it's fun to conduct um my favorite teaching moment uh has nothing to do with teaching band per se but everything to do with teaching band we were playing the alma mater uh it was my first year at this new school with seniors and we were playing an alma mater that they had never played before um we had practiced it 300 times and we get to the game and we're in the stands and it was one of the few things that i conducted that my drum majors didn't conduct and so i get up and this is i don't know we're probably five games into the season here and i go to conduct it and one side of my stands plays in one time period and the other side of my stands i think is playing pomp and circumstance and um so I cut them off in the middle of it. And I just, I mean, the I, I yelled because it was in the middle of a football game and it's loud there. Um, but I know it was the look on my face and the fact that I hadn't done it ever to them. Uh, and I remember my seniors, my, my 18 year old seniors just turning into puddles of mush. I just dying, you know, because I was disappointed. And for some reason that to me was a big click moment. And that, that was my favorite teaching moment because I was like, you know, all I did was point out that they did something wrong and they had the wherewithal and the leadership to go, yeah, we did. And we are not happy that we didn't look good, that we looked, you know, mediocre in the stands and they were all just beside themselves. I didn't have to lift a finger. They punished themselves, you know, and then I took them aside later and gave them a pep talk and, you know, it's fine. It happens. But, you know, that was my favorite teaching moment. Uh, and then my favorite moment as a music student is I'm going to, I guess, just be a nerd here. We were playing a uh, County Dairy. I'm a euphonium player. And it's just a sending line that just keeps going and keeps mm -hmm. going. You get to the big moment, man. It was the first time ever I got goosebumps and like cried while I was playing. And I, I tell you, once you hit that, it's like, you're always looking for it and you can't ever find it again. It's miserable. You know, it's like, it's like when you write a, a new good piece of music and you're like, this is finally it. And then the next piece comes along and you kind of stare at that old piece like it's yesterday's news, you know? So um, anyway, so those are, those are mine. Those are great. Um, okay. So favorite piece to teach. Honestly, I, I picked one that's <clears throat> more on the younger side. Um, Cause I, I taught a lot of middle school too, but uh, so it was called um, March of Spree by David Gorham. And so I don't know if people know that, but I, gosh, I just love that march. And it, one year I, in this band that I was doing, that was mostly all seventh graders. I had, it was a huge band that year. This new school had opened. We just had a ton of kids and I had like 20, 20 trumpets in there or something. And it opens with just little trumpets. And I was so proud because, um, well, it was just a really good teaching tool for them, but getting them to all match and sound, <laughs> you know, match each other and stuff. But it was a great piece. I loved it for, uh, cause it's very tuneful but uh, teaching a little bit of syncopation and style for that grade level. I just have always enjoyed that march um, so much. So anyway, uh, favorite teaching moment. Let's see. Okay. Well, let's, I don't know. You know, there's, there's a lot, but one of them just was this in particular year. I had this crazy stellar group of beginning French horns. They were just on fire. They were so motivated. They just kept me on my toes and they were hilarious. So we could just do the, just the most fun things in that class. We would do stuff we were working on elephant calls and it was just these you know working on their flexibility but it was so cool it was so good for them and then we would also often with my beginner classes we would draw things on the board about like the shape of our sound and we, individuals would play and we'd go up and draw that kind of thing and somehow it morphed i remember that year into this elephant thing and so every then every day they would add on to this elephant and it was just this drawing on the board it was just crazy so i will i will always remember that class um, and how, and they just went on to become really good uh, high school and beyond uh, horn players and stuff. But they were just, that's just one of the most enjoyable 
long term, long moments, you know, it was all year I got to have them. It was really fun. Um, okay. And then my favorite, uh, one of my favorite moments as a music student, for sure, um, is this reminds me of Tyler's a little bit, but I was in the symphony orchestra at Northwestern and we were playing um, Shostakovich five and we're in a rehearsal. And so I'm, I'm back there, trumpet player. I'm about to start counting. We were on the third movement, the Largo, you know, and so I'm back there just starting to count my rest, <laughs> you know, but, and the way the strings, I think this is one of the moments where I started to really listen to what else was going on. Um, pay attention to different colors and stuff, but it opens with those strings. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I was just uh, so, so emotionally overcome, but I just started weeping, you know, just sobbing. And I wasn't even playing, <laughs> you know, and I remember the other trumpets around me were like, are you going to be okay? And I was like, I, I don't know. So I have no idea why at that moment in a rehearsal, I was just so overcome with emotion, but I'll never forget that. That was amazing. Those are great moments. Thank you for sharing. Um, before we end, I want to give you a chance to plug um, your businesses and make sure people could be customers of yours and continue to perform your music. Um, and also I'd like to know any last minute advice you'd give to the growing band director out there. Well, first I think, um, I think Carol, you should at least get a, a little, a little note at some point when David sees that bump in his royalties from the, uh, shout out <laughs> of the piece in a absolutely. Of <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be a little broad here because I, I represent Excelsior Music Publishing. Um, so I encourage everyone to look at all of our wonderful composers. We now represent mm -hmm. Kendor, Kendor Music Publishing, Winger Jones Publications, RBC Publications, uh, was based in Texas as well as Excelsior Music Publications. And we, uh, I said that wrong, Excelsior Music Publishing, my boss will kill me. If I said <laughs> um, and uh, we just we just uh, we just picked up a bunch of great expanded relationships with composers like Carol, um, and so mm -hmm. I encourage you to look at all of the music. Um, you know, uh, we have five hundred composers that have, for the last uh, geez, seventy eighty years across those companies, been you know big big voices in the band world, as well as some awesome brand new folks and new voices that are up and coming. And so I encourage everyone to take a look. And of course, uh, if you enjoyed some of the things we talked about, the complete warm up for band is a great new resource. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into it. Yeah, there it is. Great cover. Um, and uh, me and Carol are going to be out and about talking about it all over the country here soon. So um, come say hi and check it out. Yeah. And I'd, I'd also just like to say thank you for having us today for sure. And um yeah, um, you know, I've really enjoyed working with the Excelsior team, and so I've actually just become one of their exclusive composers. So that's been really exciting. Um, and but you can always email me with questions too. And uh, I mean, please, either of us, if you have questions about the book or anything, just email us. You can <clears throat> look us up online. And um, yeah, it's been really fun. So we're we're excited, but we can't thank you enough for having us on today. Absolutely. Let this bell finish ringing. At my pleasure. And I'd like to thank Kyle Smith with the growing band director for giving me the opportunity to talk to some big hitters in our world. And um, again, you are awesome. And I love performing your music and just really grateful. You took the time to help out uh, the band directors, new and old. And um, this was awesome. Thank you so much. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.